Hi, I'm Michael Rubenstein, Sony Artisan of Imagery. I started shooting a long time ago in Portland, Oregon. I, uh, I actually worked for an environmental group. I was a development director way back in the day, and we were hiring a lot of photographers to do landscape pictures in the forests, um, documenting the places we were trying to protect. And they got paid more and had more fun than I did. So I quit and decided I was going to be a photographer. And I was terrible for a long time. Finally realized that I needed some help. I went to grad school, learned how to be a photographer, and uh, been working all around the world since. I started out trying to be a photojournalist. And I worked a little bit for the weekly publications in Portland. There were a bunch of other photographers in, in Oregon that helped me to start to learn. And I spent a lot of time in Powell's bookstore on the floor in the photo book aisle looking at other people's work. After Portland, I moved to Bombay. And I lived in India for three years. Um, I worked with Redux Pictures there. And I covered all of South Asia. I really wanted to move to China, and they said, well, we've got somebody in China, so, you know, that's not going to work. But if you want to move to India, we'll sign you right now. <laughs> so I said, okay, cool. And I went to India. India was a crazy place to work, a crazy place to live. It was just constant, 100% insanity at all times. And, you know, as a photographer in India, or really anywhere in South Asia, I think, there's just so much to photograph constantly. There's, you know, you go out on the street and there's always something that you've never seen before, always something that you want to point your camera at and record and show people. So for me, you know, it's incredible color, there's incredible people, there's just bizarre things happening all around you at all times, you know, all the entire spectrum of emotions, the entire spectrum of life, basically. And it was all right there in front of you to capture any day of the week that you walked out of your apartment. When I was ready to leave India, I moved back to New York, where I grew up. Today I'm going to talk about why I shoot 4K for HD delivery, my camera and lens choices, my settings for 4K shooting, post-production techniques for 4K, including stabilization, cropping, moves on footage, and creating a multi-camera look for interviews. You know, it took me a while to really dive into shooting with 4K. Um, originally, I had a lot of misconceptions about it. I thought that, you know, the files were too big. I felt like no one was going to use them. I kind of thought that everything is going out in HD, so what's the point in shooting in 4K? And then, you know, I started thinking about it a little bit more, and I related it to my work as a still photographer, and I said, you know, even though a magazine's only going to print an image that's going to be, say, 8.5 by 11 for, you know, one page, I still want to shoot it as large as I can so I can get the best quality out of it so that I can crop into it if I have to, so I can adjust it if I have to, and because I just want the biggest file that I can possibly get, right? Because who knows what's going to happen to that image. Maybe it's going to be used on a billboard. You know, maybe it's going to show as a feature film. Who knows? So I want it to be as big as possible. So I started shooting in 4K, which is basically the same principle, right? It's four times as big as HD. It's a big deal. You know, to be able to shoot 4K in a tiny little affordable camera, it's amazing. 4K files are great. They have a wider dynamic range. They are huge. So if I need to, I can crop in on the image and I can make it look like I've got two shots, like I've got a close shot and a long shot out of one file. I can do camera movements so I can pan from one side of the frame to the other without actually having to pan, which means I can make really nice smooth movements in the editing software. And I can also stabilize shots. You know, when I shot HD for everything, if I wanted to stabilize something, it would crop way in and then maybe the stabilized footage wouldn't look quite as good as the other footage. But when I do it with 4K it, and, I'm, and I'm outputting to HD, it looks great because the, the file is still three times as big as the HD file would be. So even when I you know, crunch it down for, for HD, it still looks fantastic with stabilization on it. So you know, shooting with a, with a 4K, the files you get are 
very, um, you know, you can manipulate them a lot. You can do a lot of, of work to them in the editing software, you know, which gives me, as a director, a lot of options. When I go out and I shoot something for, say, NBC or one of my other clients, and it's just me, and I don't have a whole crew, I don't have a B shooter, you know, it's just me and, you know, two or three cameras, I can cover way more range than I could cover by, you know, by myself with HD. You know, when I'm shooting with 4K, I can do all kinds of things with this footage that I couldn't do before, and I can make it look like I've got a second shooter on set, when really it's just me by myself operating a couple of cameras and the audio. There's a ton of content creation going on these days. You know, every company wants content for social media. They all want you to create beautiful, smart, short pieces for their Instagram or their Facebook or their YouTube page and they want you to do it on a budget. So, you know, it's not like I'm going to have a 40 person crew and, you know, a bunch of cameras and a DP and a bunch of operators. I got to go out and do that all by myself with one assistant and I want footage that's going to give me as many options as I can get in post. In 2012, I got T-boned by an SUV on my motorcycle, and I was pretty badly injured. I was out of work for a couple of years, and when I came back, I bought an A7R to take camping with my girlfriend and her friends, and it was great. It was tiny, it was light, and it didn't hurt my back and my shoulder the way you know the camera I had been using did. I loved it. It was great, and as soon as I got back from that camping trip, I started figuring out if I could use uh, those cameras professionally, the Sony cameras professionally. And I ditched all my Canon stuff. I mean, the fact that the camera was so small and so light really helped um, me after my injuries. I could carry it around and I didn't even really know it was, it was there. It was, you know, half the size and weight of the cameras I had been using. And it, it was real helpful. Currently, I use the a7R2 and the a7S2 almost exclusively. I have an RX1 R2 that I bring around with me pretty much everywhere I go, and I love it. And then occasionally, I'll, I'll supplement in an RX100 IV and a 6300. My favorite lens is and always will be the 3514. Hands down, favorite lens. It's always been the lens I go to for everything. You know. Starting out as a photojournalist, it was my go-to for just about every assignment I had. Um, it's a very versatile lens. You can shoot a wide portrait with it. You can shoot a landscape. You can, you know, you can you can shoot anything with that lens. It's just great. Shallow depth of field. It looks beautiful. You know, you can stop it down and and get everything in focus. It's it's my favorite. I also really love the 8514 that just came out, the G Master lens. It's a beautiful portrait lens. And if I have to use a zoom, if I want to carry less equipment with me, I'll bring the 24 to 70. One of my favorite things about the Sony cameras is that I can adapt any lens from any manufacturer to use with my Sony cameras, right? So I can use compact primes from Zeiss when I'm filmmaking. I can use um, old Canon or Nikon lenses that have a specific look that I'm, I'm going for. It can be anything. It can be, it, it basically turns the A7S2 or A7R2 into a brain that you're attaching any kind of lens to as opposed to, you know, a, a lockdown camera system where you can only use the lenses from one manufacturer. It gives you infinite possibilities and infinite looks, which as a filmmaker is really important to me, you know, because I want to have the exact look at the at the right moment for the right scene you know I want to have the ability to use any one of a thousand lenses until now you never had that ability with a three thousand dollar camera or an affordable camera that somebody could you know anybody could buy I've been talking a lot about wide dynamic range uh, and what that means is you can capture the highlights and the shadows, right? So it's a ton of range within the image, right? There's bright spots, there's dark spots. So to capture that all, what you want to do is shoot in what's called S-log, 
So in these cameras, in the A7S2, you've got S-Log3, you've got S-Log2. In the A7R2, you've got S-Log2, okay? S-Log will look on the back of the camera extremely washed out. It won't really have very much color to it, and it won't have any contrast. That's a good thing. It means that it's capturing tons of information. And then, when you get it into your editing software, you put what's called a LUT on it. It's a lookup table. And it will tell the software what that footage should actually look like. So it'll become beautiful, wide dynamic range footage that looks great, doesn't have any blown highlights, and doesn't have any crunch shadows. And that's what you want. Now it takes a little bit of time to figure out how to shoot with S-Log3 or S-Log2, but once you get it down, you'll never go back. Because raw files carry a sidecar image, which is a, a processed JPEG, right? So when you're shooting S-Log, you don't get that. Not at all. If you have an external monitor like an Atomos, you can put the LUT on the monitor so you can be live watching your footage the way it'll look after you process it. So you can really see what it looks like. Otherwise, you're kind of relying on your own experience to know what it's going to look like later, but it can be difficult if you're just starting out. Recording in S-Log gives you a lot of space to edit your, edit your footage for color and look after the fact, right? So if you shoot in S-Log3 or S-Log2, you can change the color, you can come in on the blacks, you can, you know, you can really bump up the highlights, and you'll still have that information in the footage. It's not a raw file, but it's very close. If you're shooting S-Log2 on the A7R2, your base ISO is 800. So you can go up from there if it's darker, but you can never go lower than that. On the A7S2, if you're shooting S-Log3, your base ISO is 1600. With S-Log, because you need to be able to get the whole dynamic range, the cameras are set to a minimum ISO, and that minimum ISO is very sensitive. So for either one of these cameras, if you're going to be shooting outdoors and you want to use a, um, a, a large aperture like 2.0 or 2.8 or 1.4, you know, if you want a real shallow depth of field in your shot, you need neutral density filters in the front of your camera. I always shoot an S-Log. <laughs> yeah, unless I have to turn around the same day, you know, then I won't shoot an S-Log, but if, if I have time to edit and I have time to go and work with a colorist, um, then I always shoot an S-Log. I always shoot 24 frames a second unless my client requests something else. Um, occasionally for web content, they'll request 30 frames a second, but almost all the time I shoot 24 because I want a more cinematic feel. So you want your, you want your shutter speed to be twice the frame rate. Which So if I'm shooting at 24 frames a second, I want my shutter speed to be a 50th of a second. Right? Now, yeah, I can go faster than that. I can shoot it at a 2,000th of a second but it means that my footage is going to look very stuttery. It's going to look really weird. It's not going to have that smooth motion that 24 frames a second has because there'll be no blur in the images. But you can do it. I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, it's something you can do. So it, because you, know, you can't just jack up your shutter speed, you need to figure out another way to reduce the amount of light coming into the camera if you want a really wide aperture. And that's where neutral density filters come in. So I carry a ton of ND filters. I carry graduated ND filters, and I carry flat ND filters. You know, I carry one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, ten stop solid ND filters, and I carry one, two, three, and four graduated filters. Graduated means that the bottom of the filter is clear and it slowly gradiates up to four stops of light reduction at the top. So like say you are photographing a sunset and you want the ground or the water to be properly exposed for, 
but the sun and the sunset in the sky is, you know, four stops brighter, you can put that graduated filter on and it'll blend it in nicely and it'll look great. And then once you bring that raw file back into, you know, Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever program you use, you can make it perfect. With filmmaking, you don't get to do that. So you absolutely have to have the gradated filter or the flat uh, you know, three, four stop neutral density filter on the front of the camera. Now I use a system from view filters where you can stack them. So you can put a three stop neutral density filter on the front and then you can put a graduated three stop on in front of that so you can knock the sky down six stops and only have three stops at the, on the ground. You know, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. You can put three filters in front of the cameras. I always use an external monitor when I'm shooting video because I need to see a large format picture so I can compose and I can get focus. For critical focus, I think it's important to have a big monitor, right? I don't always need an 18-inch monitor or you know a 24-inch monitor, but having a nice 7-inch monitor on top of the camera really helps me. Focus is incredibly important when you're shooting in 4K. And you're using a full frame camera with very wide lenses, well, wide aperture lenses, like a 1.4 or a 1.2 or a 2.0. You absolutely need to make sure that your focus is spot on. You know, there's no fake in it anymore. So you have to be able to zoom in and see exactly what you're focusing on and make sure that you've got it sharp. Otherwise, you won't be able to push in on it later. You won't be able to show a really tight shot because maybe you focused on the wrong eyelash <laughs> and your, you know, your, your focus point is, is very short. You know, using an external monitor, whether it's a Sony or an Atomos monitor or a small HD monitor is very, very helpful because you can see exactly what you're doing. There's a few different features on the Sony cameras that you can use to help make sure your focus is sharp, right? We've got focus peaking, which will in camera change um, the in focus section of your image to whatever color you choose. I usually keep mine on red, but you can do white or yellow. When the part of the person or scene is in focus, it will turn the color that you set it to. So that's very helpful. The Sony cameras will also allow you to zoom in up to eight times to see if you know, an eye is in focus or if, um, you know, an eyelash is in focus for that matter. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So you can make sure that with shallow depth of field uh, images that you can really see what you're doing. One of the other things I really like about the Sony cameras is the ability to use autofocus when you're shooting video. Um, this used to, didn't really used to be something that existed, you know. With SLRs, the focus would be really bad. The autofocus would be really bad. But with these new Sony cameras, you, you can actually track subjects. It's amazing. You can lock on to a subject and track them while you're shooting. So what I'll do is when I'm a one-man band and I'm shooting, say, an interview and I've got two or three cameras set up, I'll monitor one of those cameras, but then I'll lock focus in with the other two and let them follow my subject and it works great. So whenever I'm shooting in 4K, actually whenever I'm shooting video at all, my settings are 24 frames a second, which is 24p. I'm shooting at a 50th of a second shutter speed and I'm always shooting in S-Log. So if it's on an A7S II, I'm shooting in S-Log 3 and if it's in an A7R 2 I'm shooting in S-Log 2. I generally turn off just about everything else, any um, dynamic range settings, any color settings that aren't S-Log go right out the window. Um, I, if I'm on a tripod, I turn off my uh, internal stabilization, but if I'm hand-holding, I'll leave the stabilization on because it's incredible. Shots that I could never have, have handheld, you know, two years ago, now I, can, now I can do it with the internal stabilization. I'm going to show you what it's like when you take a 4K clip and drop it into a 1080 timeline. 
We've already made our timeline. I'm working in Final Cut today, but this process is pretty similar for Premiere or Avid or any other video editor that you might use. I'm going to grab one of our clips, which is 4K, and drop it into that timeline. Now, you can see here that it just looks normal, like I dropped an HD clip into an HD timeline or a 4K clip into a 4K timeline, but it's not actually true. When you go to Spatial Conform and you see that it says Fit, what it's essentially done is taken a 4K image and shrunk it down to a 1080 frame. Now, if you click on that drop-down menu and you click None, you'll see the real size of the 4K image within the 1080 frame, and you'll see that it's much bigger. Because the image is so much larger with 4K than it is with HD, there are many more things that you can do with a 4K image than you could do with an HD image. The 4K image is four times as big as what you would get with HD. So you can do things like crop your frame. You can push in on a subject. You can do fake camera movements. And you can stabilize your frame without degrading the image quality. You couldn't do that if you just shot HD. I've got a shot here that I shot from pretty far away, right? I want to crop this shot so that it looks like I was shooting it with maybe a 300 millimeter lens instead of the 85 that I had on the camera. When you shoot HD for HD or you shoot 4K for 4K delivery, you can't really crop very much. You can maybe crop 5 or 10% before you start to lose image quality. But because we're shooting 4K for HD delivery, we have almost four times the size of, of film that we need to deliver in HD. So we can really come in in places and not lose any image quality at all. Why don't you watch me do this? I've got my shot, and you can see that it's pretty far away. But I'm going to click on the Crop button, and I'm going to go to Crop. And then I am going to select the edge, hit the Shift, and I'm going to come all the way into there. And then I'm going to move it to follow the rule of thirds, which all of you should know. Beautiful. So that is the new shot, exported in HD. You're not going to have any image degradation at all. And here you can see the difference between the two crop, between the crop shot and the uncrop shot. This is the wide shot, and this is the crop shot. And now I'm going to throw that color profile right over it, and boom, it's starting to look like a piece of our little film. When you're shooting an interview, sometimes you want to have options for your shot. So you might have a three camera setup where you've got one shot of both people, one shot, and then a shot on each side of the interviewer and the interviewee, right? So then you've got three shots that you can go to. But over the course of, say, a 10 or 15 minute interview, that's going to get real boring. So if you shoot it in 4K, you can really come in on your subjects. Now, we didn't really shoot an interview today, but I did shoot two people on a bench with one camera so I can show you what I'm talking about. So I'm going to throw my color on them so they don't look green. And what I'm going to do now is copy this and paste it so you can see the difference. And then on the second clip, I'm going to crop in so you can see just how far you can come in with 4K when you're exporting for HD. So we're going to go to crop, not Ken Burns. We don't want any movement. We're going to grab that edge, and we're going to come up halfway, and then we're going to come right in on them. So I'm going to come in on them, and now we have a totally different shot that we can cut to. It's great. Now, if you want to do that in the timeline, what you want to do is you've got your clip, you're playing your clip, and then you come to a spot where maybe they pause for a second, you take your blade tool, you cut it, and then you go to where you want to bring it out. You select the section that you want to make larger, and then you hit the crop, and you make it 
make the zoom in happen, maybe. There we go. And then you put it on their faces. You can make it even a little bit bigger. And then you make it look like you've got two cameras. Watch this. They're talking wide. It's a big wide shot. And then oh, it popped in. And then she says something witty, maybe a little mean. He looks at her and it pops out. Beautiful. Doing a push in camera is expensive. To get a stable push, you need a dolly, you need a camera operator, or you need a slider, and you need someone to pull focus. It's a lot of work on set. So if you have a shot that's already in focus that you already like, but you shot it in 4K and you're delivering in HD, you can push in and make some camera motion happen in post. You can do it in Final Cut. So we're going to start with a push in. Um, on footage and the, the way that you do that is you, you find your clip that you want to work with and then you, you go through it until you find the spot that you really want to use and I think I've got it right here. So I'm going to cut my clip up with the blade tool and then I'm going to go all the way through until I have the footage that I want and I'm going to cut it again with the blade tool so I've got the clip that I want. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little crop button right over here. And that's going to open up another editing window for me. And I'm going to click on Ken Burns. And so I'm clicked on the red box here so I can control the end of where the camera goes. And I'm going to make it smaller. Now, you know it's kind of crazy to think about, but because this footage is so big, I can actually get my frame down really small. So what we're going to do is we're going to crop from full size all the way down to about a quarter of the screen size, quarter of the image size. And it's still not going to lose any quality when you take 4K to HD. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to press the play and it's going to come in. Perfect. Look at that. So I'm going to take that clip. I'm going to erase the other ones. And we've just got our one clip right here. Click done and I've got it. Now this clip is still an S log. So what I want to do is put a LUT on it so that it actually looks right and doesn't look all washed out and kind of green like it does right now. So I'm going to use Color Finale to do that in Final Cut 10. Um, in other programs, there are other ways to do it. But for Final Cut Pro, Color Finale is the way to go. So I've got my push in already done. And you can take a look at it now. We start back. And then when the mom kisses the cheek, looks really good. We're right in tight. and. As you can see, the color still looks weird. It's washed out. There's not a lot of contrast. So it looks desaturated, and it looks weird, but it's not. It's S-Log3. So what you do now is you use Color Finale to put a LUT on the footage, and you just drag it over. I've made one earlier, uh, so I, I know that it's going to look good. Um, you experiment a little bit. And if you need to tweak it at all, you just open up the Color Finale browser, and you can mess with the curves a little bit. You can brighten it up. You can add a little contrast. You can do pretty much whatever you need to do in Color Finale, um, including working with the color wheels, with curves, and even working with the hue, saturation, and luminosity of all the different colors uh, in the CMYK chart. Um, and you can change the opacity of each one also. So I've come up with this color, which is a little bit of a throwback LUT, a little magenta, looks, you know, maybe like films used to look back in the 70s a little bit. And you can see the difference when I turn it off and on. There you go. Okay, so now we're going to do the pan. I'm going to take this 
and I'm going to copy it, and then I'm going to paste it so that we can see it before and after. This is the shot. We've got the older girl looking off into the distance. It's a nice medium range portrait, but I want to pan it. So I'm going to go to the copy, and I'm going to click on Ken Burns, and we're going to go to the beginning, which is the green. By clicking on it, we're going to make it small. Little trick is that about halfway down the frame is how small you can get before you start to lose quality in the image. So we're going to start there, just a little bit smaller. There we go. And then we're going to end over here and we're just going to go straight across. All right, there we go. So let's see how that looks. I've trimmed the clip now, and we've got a nice little transitional pan that we can insert into the storyline as a, as a quick little piece that'll move the story along. Here it is. That's it. I've got a clip here that I really like. Unfortunately, my camera hands weren't very stable when I was shooting it, so it's all over the place. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add some stabilization to the clip, and because I shot it in 4K and I'm exporting to HD, I can still do that without losing image quality. So first, for this one, I'm going to add my color so that I know what it looks like and so the computer knows what it looks like before I do the stabilization. And then I'm going to select the clip and I'm going to click Stabilize and it's going to analyze for dominant motion. And it's a real short clip so it shouldn't take very long to do this. Oh, it's almost done. Very exciting. All right, so here we go. So now I can see there's still a little bit of bounce but it's not so bad and because it's handheld, I think I can live with it, but I can also kind of tweak the stabilization a little bit so that it's a little more heavy-handed. All right, here we go. We're going to go to Smooth Cam, and we're going to jack up the stabilization, and that should help. And the reason I can jack up the stabilization like that is because I shot it in 4K and I'm exporting to HD. See, when you really increase the stabilization, it crops in on the image a little bit. And if I did that with HD footage for HD export, I would lose some image quality. Now, to see the difference, what I really need to do is uh, render it. So I'm going to render this right now, Control R, and then I'm going to be able to show you both clips back to back as soon as it's done. So I'll show you the stabilized shot first, then I'll show you the pre-stabilization shot. And here we go. You ready? It's very exciting. This is the stabilized shot, and doesn't really move very much. And this is the unstabilized shot where I'm kind of all over the place. So we've been working in Final Cut X today. I just want everyone out there to know that no matter what program they're using to edit their footage, you can do all of these things. You can do it in Premiere, you can do it in Avid, you can do it in iMovie, and you can do it in Final Cut X. I've shown you a bunch of the tricks that I use when I'm delivering 4K footage to my clients in HD, and that is why I always shoot in 4K regardless of what size I'm delivering in. Today we learned about why I shoot 4K for HD delivery, my camera and lens choices, my settings for 4K shooting, post-production techniques for 4K, including stabilization, cropping, moves on footage, and creating a multi-camera look for interviews. There are so many options with 4K footage from Sony cameras. You should get up and go make a movie. No, really. Get, go, go make a movie, go, get out of here, make a movie.